right, good morning, good to see you. Trust you're doing well, trust you've had a good week. Thank you so much for being here today. If you're able to stand, grab a hymnal, turn over 202, Amazing Grace. Stand with us if you're able. Let's sing this, all of us sing it together. Amazing Grace this morning. Sing this last verse with us this morning. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. All right, amen. Good to see you here this morning. Do trust you had a good Thanksgiving and a good opportunity to sit down and visit with some family or friends and eat some food and, and thank the Lord for his mercy and his grace. Thank you for all of you that was able to help us on Thursday as far as a preparation and cooking and distribution of the food. Thank you so much for that. Uh, just to kind of give you a quick update, I think that we was able to make uh, 46 individual plates and then also uh, one uh, meal for an entire family. So Thank you so much for that, and, and those of you who helped distribute them in the community, thank you so much. God's been so good to us, amen, and we can never thank him enough for that, so let's be in prayer for that. 
Also, be in prayer for next Sunday. Next Sunday is our anniversary Sunday. We'll say more about that in a few moments. Uh, out on the table, there's some flyers there. Uh, you can hang on bulletin board at school or work if you're LA to do so. If you uh, do take those with you, if we need more of them, we'll print more of them off. Uh, be sure and keep up with that. And also, be in prayer, be in prayer about what you're going to cook and bring for next Sunday's because we're going to eat again. We do a lot of that around here this time of year. And uh, so we'll have a potluck after the, after the meal. I mean, after the morning service, after the meal, we'll probably have one of them too. But uh, <laughs> uh, we'll have a potluck meal after the morning service. And uh, then we'll have several guests and visitors. We'll say more about that in a few moments. But thank you so much for that. Uh, choir practice tonight, 4.30 for the men. Men, 4.30. 5 o'clock for everyone in the choir, all right? We've got a couple of things we want to cover there, getting ready for anniversary of Sunday. So 4.30 for the men, 5 o'clock for everyone else or that would be everyone, and not everyone else, but everyone, and, uh, and got a lot of things there. Men's Bible study will be back on again on Tuesday. Sean's in the nursery this morning, but he had his teeth pulled this past Tuesday, so, but he's back to talking and good now and feeling better, so he'll be back in Men's Bible study Tuesday and then tonight at the Lord's Supper. So let's be in prayer for all these things. Thank you, guests and visitors, for being here this morning. We're so appreciative of you willing to come out and be with us, and, got, and we want to help you any way we can. So... If you need something, let us know. If we can't handle it, we'll find someone that can, all right? And uh, so we want to do that. Thank you so much for being here. Let's pray right now. Lord, we come to you at this time. We thank you for the day you've given us, the opportunity to be here in your house once again. We ask you, Lord, to uh, speak to us and through us this morning. Lord, I pray that Holy Spirit would be in our midst, in our presence. I pray that our hearts would be moved right now as we sing these songs and prepared, Lord, for the uh, teaching and the preaching of God's Word. Lord, we, we, music is... Is vital, Lord. It, it prepares us. But not only that, Lord, it's a ministering. And Lord, I pray that right now you would speak to us, uh, Lord, through the words of the songs that we sing. May, may help us realize that these words are true words. They're words that are confirmed in the Bible, Lord. We're not just singing for entertainment purposes, Lord. We're singing praises unto you. Lord, we thank you for every guest and visitor that's here this morning. We thank you for every regular attendee. Lord, for those that are traveling, we pray that you provide for them. We ask you, Lord, now to guide us. Be with our services this morning as well as tonight, Lord's Supper tonight. We pray, Lord, to be with us next Sunday as it's our 13th anniversary of our church. And, Lord, you've been so good to us. Uh, Lord, you've been so faithful. So, Lord, help us, Lord, even right now uh, to move our hearts towards you, to prepare our hearts and minds right now for what you have for us this hour. And we'll give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Keep your hymnal, though. Let's turn over to 206, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. It's, you have to take a deep breath when you sing this one, but let's sing this one of the Lord this morning. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Sing it out loud. Wonderful grace of Jesus. My transgression sing it greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the utter. grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus, it's Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the 
singing it amen singing it under the lord thank you again visitors and guests for being here don't forget next sunday no sunday school starting at 10 30 inside your bulletin there there should be a little note uh, reminding you of a few things there and uh, so be sure and take note of that uh 10 30 invite some guests and visitors it'll be great a uh, great time for all that's here uh then we'll uh, after special music and a lot of things that morning and then after Brother Vance preaches, we'll have lunch for everybody that's here, no charge. And how many times you get that, amen? And uh, so uh, the reason it's no charge because you're bringing it. And, uh, so, uh, and so be sure and be part of that. And if you're one of our guests, that doesn't apply to you, you just come and eat with us. But the rest of us is going to feed you, all right? And uh, so uh, that will be right after the service. And then right after we eat, we'll come back over and have some more testimonies and singing and some more preaching. And we just kind of make a day of it for anniversary Sunday every year and kind of hang around all day long. And somewhere between 3 and 4 o'clock, we'll wrap it up, all right? And uh, we'll have a great time there serving the Lord. Uh, sometimes you all get started and it's like we can't get you to stop, you know? And uh, so that's a wonderful thing when that happens. We're thankful for that. And so be sure to come and hang out with us. If you know someone, maybe they go to church somewhere else. Uh, maybe after their service they can come and join us for the afternoon. It'll be a great opportunity to us to get to know them and for them to get to know us, and we'll just testify to the Lord together. Amen. But Rick, if you would ask for his blessing upon the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in your house this day. We pray, Lord, for when you come into our midst, Lord, that you just uh, are each of our hearts would be open to what you'd have for each one of us this day. We pray that we'd be open and obedient to the work of the Holy Spirit. We ask now, Lord, your blessing upon this offering. Amen.
Psalm 205, Sinner Saved by Grace, Great Truth. If this applies to you, if you know this song this morning, sing it in the Lord loud. If you don't know that you're saved this morning, we'd like to help you know you can be saved before you leave here today. We'd like to show you what the Bible says about salvation. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin and all uncleanness, right? 205, Sinner Saved by Grace. If you could see what I once was, if you could go with me back to where I started from, then I know you would see the miracle of love that took me in its sweet embrace and made me what I am today, a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Uh, we don't have to know what everyone was before they come to know Christ, but knowing that what we are in Christ is a wonderful, marvelous thing. Amen. Miss Cheryl's going to sing for us just this morning. Good to have a lot of her family visiting with us today, and her mom, and dad, and sister, and brother-in-law, and nephew, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, and uh, I'd like to pick at him a little bit. That's all right, right? And uh, so uh, good to have them with us today, and good to have Mr. Bill back with us, and Miss Joyce, and Judy, and, and Abe. He's been... Let me see, he's been 100 days in rehab this year, all right? And uh, so we're glad he's back with us this morning, and he and the rest of the family, and the family already confirmed he ate way too much for Thanksgiving. And uh, so uh, he blew his diet, and uh, as did the rest of us. Amen? And the rest of you guests and visitors, thank you so much for being here today. Let's, let's uh, see what the Lord has for us. Amen? <laughs> time will be when we see loved ones there those who have gone before eternal joys to share and oh what a song when the blood was Strong, start singing a song the angels cannot sing. Oh, what a moment when we see Jesus, when we stand face to face in his embrace and thank him for a i 
past will no longer gather only what's done for Christ is all that will matter the seeds we have sown will then be made known what joy shall fill a raptured souls that day oh what a moment when we see jesus when we stand face to face in his embrace and thank him for amazing grace oh what a moment when we stand face to face in his embrace and thank him for amazing grace oh what a moment when we see him oh what a moment when much for that. Don't forget, uh, choir practice tonight for our men at 4.30, as we're going to have an all-men's choir next uh, uh, Sunday, but also we're going to have a mixed choir, so everybody else show up at 5, all right? And we'll dismiss our junior church at this time, uh, so you be in prayer for them as they go next door and uh, give attention to God's Word there as we give attention to God's Word here. Uh, some of our folks are still traveling, uh, so you be in prayer for them that are making it back, and many of you are here visiting for the weekend, maybe someone. I appreciate you being with us today. I pray for your traveling mercies as well. And all of you guests and visitors, thank you so much for being here. If we can help you with anything, we want to do so very, very much so. And uh, so don't forget about all these events. There, the anniversary and then choir practice, men's Bible study. And then, of course, the ladies' craft night on Monday, a, mon a week from tomorrow. That's the day after our anniversary service. Ladies, if you want to be part of that, you need to see my wife today. I think there's 17, you said, has already signed up for that, which is wonderful. Uh, but if you don't let her know, she will not have the things prepared for you that night, and you will be an observer, not a participator. All right? So you'll need to let her know today so she can have the things ready for you to participate in craft night there. And I think they're making a wreath this year. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, be very complimentary when they bring it home. All right? And uh, say, we need to hang in on the front door. That's so gorgeous. Guys. Be a great place for you to say amen, and uh, wives, help them, all right? And uh, so, uh, and it'll be a great time, and they always do wonderful things, have a good time with their craft nights, and then around this time of year, they always have something to do with the, uh, this time of year, something they can use and for decorations, and, and they're always turn out really, really well. My wife comes home telling about uh, the different variations everybody puts on them, makes them their own, and that's wonderful, amen? So don't forget about these things, keep up with all these things. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in your Bible. Uh, next Sunday we call it our anniversary homecoming. All right. Some people, when we first came out here, we put that, uh, we advertised that, I don't know, second or third year of our church. And I had several people ask me, why do you have it called homecoming? Because we, I put it, actually, if the article makes it in the paper, which we submitted, hopefully it does, but uh, I actually wrote a little bit of that in there because we have a lot of folks that uh, will maybe be willing to come with us that day that, that's came here once in the past. Maybe some folks that, uh, that have moved away or maybe they've just changed churches or whatever the case may be, but we want to invite them back at least for the afternoon service after they get out of their services somewhere else. And we want to have it a homecoming celebration, but at the same time it is an anniversary of the church. 13 years of God's faithfulness and, and rejoicing over what He's done. And there's been a lot of people come through the doors of this church over the years. A lot of different folks. We live in a kind of a transient area. A lot of people move in and move out, and, and that's okay. The uh, Lord knows that, and He keeps that, and we trust the Lord to uh, use them and feed them and provide for them wherever they land. Uh, but while they're here, we want to do the same and befriend them, and we want to uh, show kindness. So guests and visitors, let us know how we can do that. We want to give you God's Word. Most of all, uh, there's nothing more important in this world that we'll ever do more than give God's Word. 
Uh, we can do a lot of things, make a lot of friends. We can be a good humanitarian. We can be a good citizen. We can be a good politician, if that's such, is that, if, if, if that even exists. And I uh, had a hard time even saying that, you know. And, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, but the reality of it is nothing is more important than giving the gospel. Nothing we'll do with our life is more important than spreading the gospel of God's word to those that are lost and condemned in sin and giving them the good news of the gospel that they may be saved and have a home in heaven. And next week being anniversary, homecoming, a lot, a lot of our songs, our uh, congregational hymns will be about grace, but then all of our specials are going to have a, a flavor of heaven about them. All of our special music, the choir specials, the, uh, the individual specials and things like that will have, will have a flavor of heaven about them. As we think about that, there's going to be a great homecoming one of these days. And not just an anniversary of a church somewhere, not just a homecoming of a, of a church or a homecoming of a, of a it's football season. You know, a lot of it wrapped up yesterday for teams like the one I pulled for. And uh, so uh, Tennessee didn't make a bowl game. They barely made it through the regular season. But, uh, uh, you know, but you have their homecoming games, you know, where they, they celebrate and people come back from all over to go to those schools for the years and they come there and, and things like that. And, and that's kind of what the anniversary of the church is. But there's going to be a great homecoming one of these days. It's going to be like, unlike anything we've ever experienced when it, as far as coming home. Uh, several people in this, several people, and they don't even know what that is. And, uh, uh, but uh, several people in our church have had family and friends and loved ones have gone on to glory. Well, that doesn't mean they're gone. It just means there's going to be a great homecoming someday. Amen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Tonight we'll be having the Lord's Supper and, and have a great time serving the Lord and honoring that ordinance of the Bible. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning, the Bible says, Furthermore then, verse 1, we beseech you, brethren. See, notice this real quickly. The saved. So it's written to the saved. And it says, And exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. That's an amazing verse in and of itself. We won't anchor ourselves there because we'll get stuck. But it's an amazing verse there when we realize he's talking to the saved and he says, he ex exhorts you by the Lord Jesus that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. There's a direct correlation between the way we live our life and a pleasing the Lord. Some people say, well, I can do whatever I want. Uh, I, know, I know what the Bible says, and you're saved by grace through faith, not of works, any, and that not of yourself, that's any man should boast. Therefore, I can live any way I want to live because it doesn't matter how I live now that I'm saved. Let me ask you a question real quickly. If you just said some vain words and repeated something, and it didn't change the way you want to live your life, it didn't change your desires, then be careful because it may not have changed your eternity. When you become a new creature, the Bible says old things are passed away. Behold, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things become new. The way we live our life, the way we want to live our life, the desires of our life should change if we know Christ our Savior. That does not mean we're perfect. We just sang the song. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm still going to have tendencies that, that pertain to this flesh and likes and, and wants, and, 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 and this flesh is just a big baby, and yours is too. And, and, and all, we just want what we want, and we want it now. And we'll throw a temper tantrum if we don't get it sometimes. But the reality of it is, the Spirit of God moves inside of the believer, the Bible says. When Christ sent it into heaven, before he went, he told the disciples he must go. He said, but he wouldn't go and leave them comfortless. He would send the comforter. And in doing so, that comforter would indwell them, would live inside of them. It wouldn't just be one like the Old Testament that come up on them. It would live with inside the believer. And inside of us lives the very Spirit of God if you trust Christ your Savior. And as a result of that, we have someone helping guide us and instruct us on how to live our life to please Him. And Paul writes here to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, he says that we exhort you, we're encouraging you, he says, by the Lord Jesus that you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. So you would abound more and more. The reality is when we please God through our life, there's a more of an abundance in our life. There's more of an abounding in our life. The Bible says in verse 2, For ye know what commandments we have give, gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You see that word sanctification? Even your sanctification. That doesn't mean uh, what the world often claims. It means it's set apart for a specific purpose. This piano was bought for this church. Now before this piano was owned by this church, this piano is, is somewhere around 110 years old. Before it was bought for this church, I have no idea what this piano has been used for, what type of music's been played on it. I have no idea what environments and establishments it's been in. But once the church bought this piano, 
and the men carried it in here, and we tried to put it back together, and we had someone that come and knew what they were doing to tune it, and, and ever since that day, this piano has been sanctified for the Lord Jesus. This, this piano will not have the worldly music played upon it anymore. It will not be rented out on a Friday night or Saturday night to be used to, to, for some, some raiser to, fund, fundraiser to, to promote some ungodly, wicked. This, this piano has been sanctified. In other words, it's been set apart, maybe from what it once was, but it's now it's been set apart for a specific purpose, and that's to glorify God and God only. This building has been sanctified. We have been asked on a number of occasions, we get phone calls from people saying, hey, uh, we would like to use your building. Uh, we've driven by, we've seen her, so we'd like to use your building. And they, and they give me something, and I say, I, I thank you for asking, thank you for compliments about the property or whatever, but, but we just don't use it for that. We use it only for the service of the Lord. They, they say, we'll rent it. It's not for rent. It's been sanctified. But notice this text real quickly. The Bible, speak, the Bible says, brethren, the saved, if you're in this room today and you know Christ your Savior, if you know, if you, if you say, I, I, I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, well then the Bible says, here Paul says, God, through the Holy Spirit of God, he says that our life should be sanctified. It should be set apart. It shouldn't be the same life that we had before we say we knew Christ. It should be sanctified. There should be something about us that's set apart, that's different than it was, used for a different purpose than it was, with a specific goal and purpose in mind, to glorify God. That's what the word sanctification is. So he says here, verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. The Bible says that marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. In other words, the only way that we find honor in the bedroom, that God honors the bedroom, is in the vows of marriage. Catch this real quickly. I know our society is quickly changing. Our minds are quickly changed. And as a result, often, we have this, this idea, well, uh, you know, I can live however I want. I can, I can do whatever I want as long as I know I'm going to heaven. And after all, everybody else is doing the same thing. That doesn't make it right. Just because everybody else does it. The Bible says our life should be set apart. Our life should be sanctified. And we should avoid, abstain from fornication. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that we just do it. Sometimes it means we abstain. It means we, we, there's no partaking of it. Verse 4 says that every one of you should know, notice this, we should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. In other words, marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. So outside of marriage, the bed is defiled. In other words, it's dishonoring. So the Bible says, in, this, in, the, in the context here, we're going to move on down the page. I'm not getting hung up, but notice verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification. That means set apart and honor. So we're, if we're going to be engaged in an act, sexual activity with the opposite sex, then it needs to be in marriage and marriage only. Look at verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as a Gentile which knew not God. Now this is important. This verse is important. Because the lust of concupiscence would basically, for lack of a better way of putting it, for, for quickly to say it, it would just mean that we've turned what was designed to be the glory of God into the glory of man. We've taken something that was designed to be honoring and, to the Lord and, and separated unto the Lord, and we've taken it, we've, we say, well, I, but I'm not hurting anyone with what I'm doing, and we've, tried to, we've turned the glory to ourselves. Notice it's the word lust. That's a fleshly thing. It appeals to the flesh. The Bible says in the end of that verse, even as the Gentiles, and here's the important part, which knew not God. It doesn't mean just the Jews. It doesn't mean the Gentiles can't know the Lord. It just says, the Bible says, even as Gentiles which know not God. Remember, Jews and Gentiles alike come to Christ by grace through faith. Nobody comes by works. But the reality of it is, the Jews, even in their orthodoxy, even though they, could be, they, they were not saved because of the law, the law was designed, in the Old Testament, you read the law, it's, it's a law that's designed to please God. God says, if you want to please me, live this way. You ever read the book of Leviticus? He says, here's who you should marry, here's who you shouldn't marry. Here's what you should eat, here's what you shouldn't eat. Here's how you should live your life, here's how you should pray, here's how you should dress, here's how you should fix your hair. I mean, there's all kinds of things there. There's like, it is, by the way, not kind of the Levitical law, but just the Mosaic law, there's 613 laws that make up the Mosaic law. 
Now, I know we don't, we're not under the law, and we're not saved by the law. And please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We're not saved by works by any means, good nor bad. Our works don't save us, nor does our works condemn us. It's belief in Jesus Christ that saves us, and it's the unbelief that condemns us. John 3, 18, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Works has nothing to do with eternity. Nothing. Nothing. Not for saved or for lost. It don't condemn us to be lost. It doesn't save us. Works has nothing to do with eternity but they have everything to do with our life on this earth to please God as a testimony in the Lord. So he says here in verse 5, even as the Gentiles which you not God. So the Jews, there's going to be certain things that they don't do just because they're so orthodox in the law that they're, not, that they're not going to do some things, even though they haven't trusted Christ by grace through faith, they're still their life is going to be more, if you will, set aside. It's going to be more pleasing to God in life, but it doesn't change their eternity. So he says, even the Gentiles which know not God. Gentiles and Jews like it know Christ, know why we serve the Lord. We don't serve the Lord out of fear. That's every other religion of the world. Every other religion of the world serves them out of fear. Well, if I don't do this, God will, just this past week, probably someone in this room has asked somebody to come to church and someone responded like, well, if I come, the, the walls will fall in. <laughs> you know? That's fear. I mean, if I show up there, you know, that's fear. I don't live my life. We've talked about this in the past. We'll just real visit, visit again real quickly. God's not standing up there in heaven looking down on the earth with lightning bolts in his hand, just looking for somebody to throw them at, you know. You know, that's not God. That's not God. He's a loving Savior. He came to Calvary, gave his life, bled and died there for all of mankind to be saved. He's not looking to punish us. He's, the Bible says He came out in the world to condemn the world, but to save us, right? He didn't come to, be the, the, to bring us to, to condemnation. He brought us to save us from condemnation. We need to portray Christ, if you know Christ your Savior, differently than the world sees Him. The world sees Him as angry. They see Him as men, or mean. They see Him as, as, as a hater of man, but the Bible says He's a lover of mankind. He gave His, his only begotten Son. So that whosoever, that's anybody ever, <laughs> will trust Christ our Savior can be saved. He's a lover of mankind. He's not looking to condemn us, he's looking to save us. The Bible says here in verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord and his avenger of all is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Notice this real quickly, here's a point. He says in verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The Bible says in verse 8, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. What is man despising about God? You say, well, uh, but, it, but if I take a stand at work, if I tell them I'm not going to go to the Christmas party this year because there's a bunch of alcohol going to be flowing there, then, then my boss and my supervisor, that, that, that won't go over really well. So what are you, I'm not trying to be nasty this morning, but what are you afraid of? Afraid of them making fun of you? Afraid of you being an outcast? Catch this real quickly. The Bible says in verse 8, it says, He therefore that despiseth, turn that around and look at verse 7. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. So he, he therefore that despiseth what? Holiness. Well, I, but I just can't. You don't know what. You don't know my, my family. You don't know my coworkers. You don't know my boss. You don't know the people I go to school with. You don't know my next door neighbors. I know. I don't. None of us know everybody. But you know what the Bible says? The temptation is common to all men. Every man and woman upon the face of the earth is tempted. But the Bible says this of that. Temptation is common to all men, but... God hath given a way of escape. Amen. Catch this real quickly. You know the way of escape often? You know the way of escaped holiness. Holiness. I know this sounds like radical, but if you will start living your life to please the Lord, you won't be invited to some things that don't please the Lord. I mean, it's like, you just won't be invited. So you don't have to worry about saying no. You just won't be invited. 
And, and you start standing against your friends and saying, guys, I'm not going to do what you do, and, or, and I'm not going to go where you go, and they're just going to quit calling you a friend. You say, but that's my friends. No, they, you only think they are. When you stand with the Lord, you find out real quickly who your friends really are. So the Bible says in verse 8, He that despiseth, and let me intersect there, holiness despiseth not man, but God. So when someone does stand against you and say, well, maybe, maybe it is a situation of a Christmas party. We're in that time of year, and I know what it's like. I used to work in, I worked in a machine shop for two years, from 17 to 19. In 19, I, got, uh, I worked for a, a worldwide company, and they had a big Christmas party every year. And I know what it's like. And you go down to an open bar, I know what it's like. At 19 years old, I was invited to our Christmas church, I mean our church, company Christmas party, company Christmas party, and in going there to come to the Christmas party, 19 years old. She was 16. I'm thinking, this is, a, this is not some little, uh, you know, podunk machine shop like I worked at before where, where when we went down and worked till noon on, on the 23rd or whatever of December, and then we came upstairs to eat our lunch, and they said, and they had all this food there, and they had one, food of, one table of food and three tables of alcohol. It's not a little some podunk machine shop behind a house on a hill in Morristown, Tennessee, where I used to live. It's not some, I thought, this, this is a worldwide company. It'll, this will be a class act. It's at the Holiday Inn. I was 19, she was 16. You know what we showed up there? We went to the Christmas party thinking, this will be nice. You know what was there? Open bar. There was no one saying, hey, you, you shouldn't. And, and, no, 19 and 16 years old. There was no one, if we'd have wanted to go up to the bar, there was no one that they came running to the tables. Can I get you a drink? They never said, can I see your ID? No. Last one I ever went to. Every year they come around, you're going to come to this party, the boss, the supervisor. No. Well, but, we want, but, the, but the plant manager wants 100% participation. Then get rid of the alcohol. I'm not going to come. Well, well, no, no. We're not coming. Say, but you don't have to drink. I know. I know. But you know what? When you go there and you identify with that crowd, no matter what you say you do, everyone else says you didn't. And what you say you didn't do, everyone else says you did. And it's not going to be long when you hang around that which tempts you. If temptation comes to all men, you're going to be more tempted. And when you're more tempted, you're more likely to fail and to stumble. And you're going to have regrets. So when the Bible, when someone does say, well, you're not going to come, no. Well, you're not going to go with us, no. What do you, th you think you're better than us, no. They're not despising you. It's not that they hate you. The Bible says they despise holiness. They don't, how dare you be different than them? Notice this real quick, what the verse ends, verse 8 ends with this. It says, despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, notice this, who hath given us, given unto us his Holy Spirit. The reason we make these choices is not because I think I'm better than anyone else, or you think you're better than anyone else. That's not it. It's because the Holy Spirit of God inside of us guides us and says, don't do that. Don't go there. It's not just the, 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 the law of your mom and dad from living at home years and, and them saying, don't, 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 if your friends jump off a bridge, would you, you know. No, 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 that's not, it's not just them hearing that. There is an honoring of your parents to the aspect of that. But you as well as I, we all know that we'll turn against that sometimes. When mom and dad's not around and they're not watching and we know they're not going to be around and the crowd we're with will never meet my mom and dad. We know it's easy to dishonor them in that time by disobeying them but the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us so we make a choice and there's no one around watching and we make a choice because of the Spirit of God they're not despising us they're not despising man they're despising God they're despising holiness and despising holiness the Bible says this they don't even realize that it's God and the Spirit of God that, that, that's inside of us, it makes us make that choice. Look at verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are at the Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. 
In other words, he says, I'm, I'm warning you about possessing your vessel in sanctification and honor. I'm warning you. I'm telling you, you need to live your life sanctified, holy before God. You need to, you need to live your life filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit. And don't worry about what people say. They're not despising you. They're despising holiness. They're despising God. And it's God that gives you the Holy Spirit. So who are you going to honor? Who are you going to walk with? The Lord, you're going to walk with your friends. Because you're, If your friends are not walking with the Lord and you're walking with their friends, then you're, then you're walking with your friends. So we have to be careful. But he said, then he goes on from that. He goes in. He said, but it's brotherly love. That would be the love amongst the brothers and the sisters and the Lord. He says, amongst brotherly love. You know what the Bible says. Love one another. And you're doing that. He says, but, but do more of it. Don't say, well, I do love my brothers. I do love my sisters. He says, do more of it. By the way, the Bible says that's how the unbelievers of the world, that's how the unbelieving of the world knows that we're saved, is that we love the brethren. Think about that. The Bible says that the Lord Himself will testify to those that don't even know Christ as their Savior. The Lord, the God Himself will testify to them because of our love for one another that there's something different about that crowd. They're not just some gang or some clique. They're a family. That's what the Bible says. He goes on to say in verse 11, and that you, be, and that you study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. Look at the verse part, first part of verse 11, that you may study to be quiet and to do your own business. Let's be real honest for a moment. Let's just don't lift your hands, but just think in your heart right now. Probably most people spend study time in the Bible because they have a responsibility with it. To teach a class or preach a message, to do a devotion. Most people that say they're saved spend time in the Bible only for what they're going to do with it publicly. But the Bible says do your own business. When's the last time you got in God's Word, you fell on your knees in prayer just to get close to God? Just to know more of His Word. Just so that you can please Him more. When's the last time you did that for your own business? In a quiet place, in a quiet time. That's what Paul's saying here. He concludes verse 12 saying that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. The Bible says this, that if we hide God's Word in our heart, it will help keep us from sin. If we'll study the Bible to please the Lord with our life, the Bible says it will help keep us from sin. Verse 12 says it here, Paul says this way, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. In other words, when you leave your quiet place, and you leave your refuge, and you leave the church, and you leave your Christian home, and you go out into the world, you'll still be able to walk honestly among them. You'll still be able to honor and serve the Lord with your life, even when you're not in an environment of other people that are doing it. And then we're going to move on. Look, look what it says in verse 13. We talk about homecoming anniversary. But I will not have you be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, I remember, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. There's a lot of things I, I forget. You know that. It's amazing how God allows you to recall and remember certain things. And some of those things you may not even think about often, but he, he recalls them at certain times. Miss Barbara Maxwell is here this morning, who we love so much. I met Miss Barbara right shortly after her husband passed away. She hadn't been coming to our church for two or three weeks, and I was preaching a message, and I don't remember the exact message, but I remember making a statement about if loved ones die, that know the Lord, that's not a, that's not a coffin. 
It's a hope chest. You know, how many know what a hope chest is? My daughters have prepared those. <laughs> they put together things from the time they were 12, 13, 14, and up, and hoping someday to be married, you know. Thinking, I'm going to go ahead and prepare for married life. I'm going to gather some dishes and some things like that, some cookware, and I'm going to gather some garments and some household goods. And, and so one of these days, when, when the Lord gives me a spouse, and we'll have some things to help take up housekeeping with. It wasn't necessarily a hoping like, I wish I, 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 I'm, I'm really wishing someday I can. No, it's like I'm planning on being married. I'm preparing the field to plant, you know. I'm plowing the field. There's no rain in the forecast, but I'm plowing the field, you know. I remember on the way out that morning, Miss Barbara, I had just met her. I didn't know her, but just a week or two, I hadn't known her long at all. On the way out that morning, her husband had just passed away not long before that, just a few months before that, I went through that morning, she, she grabbed me and hugged me, and she said, thank you for that hope chest. Catch this real quickly. The Bible says, Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica here, and he says, listen, your life should be a life of honor. You should, you, you should know how to possess your vessel, your body, your body has a direct correlation with, with pleasing God. The way you live your life in this world has a direct correlation to how you please God. I know you can trust Christ. Remember, brethren, verse 1, we're talking to the saved. I know if you're saved, you have a home in heaven, but your body has a direct correlation with pleasing God. Can you go to heaven without pleasing God with your body? Yep, thief on the cross did. Some of the last breaths he ever took, he declared his belief in Jesus Christ. And Christ said today, thou shalt be with me in heaven, in paradise. Let me say something. Do you just want to show up in heaven? Or do you want to show up in heaven and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Well, I just want to get to heaven. If that's your attitude, then check your heart. Because it doesn't sound like your desire has been changed. It sounds like your spirit still may be dead in trespasses and sin. You may not have been made alive yet. Because even that thief on the cross there, in his last breath, when he trusted Christ as his Savior, condemned the very other criminal that denied Christ. We, we, we deserve what we're getting, but this man has done nothing amiss. There was a change in him that quickly that made him want to act differently. He wasn't cursing out blasphemies like the other one. There was a change that took place that made him want to act differently. So then, after writing those things, Paul writes, he says, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. No matter who it is that's going on before you, no matter if it's a loved one, a family, a friend, a neighbor, no matter who that's already dead, if they're dead in Christ, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about that. No matter how their life was lived, if they knew Christ their Savior, someone one time, I believe it was asked, uh, I don't remember who it was, they was asked now, the question went to, but they was, a preacher was asked one time, so let me get this right. You're, you're saying that, that, that if people will just pray and believe that Jesus will save them, they can be saved? He says, yes. He says, you're telling me uh, that, that when there's some great meeting somewhere and, and there may be 20 or 30 or 100 people come forward and, that's, and they say they got saved, you're telling me that all those are saved? He said this. He said, I can guarantee you one thing. All those that are got saved are saved. <laughs> Catch this real quickly. I can't stop someone from saying vain repetitions. I can't see someone's heart, nor can you. We can't stop from one from just saying some words, knowing what to say, and then repeating those words. We can't stop from doing that. But if they mean it from within their heart, and they believe by faith, if they believe that the words they're saying are true, if they believe when they ask Christ to come in their heart and save them, if they believe that Christ will save them, can and will save them because they asked, the Bible says they shall be saved. It's that simple. It's no more difficult or complicated than that. It's by grace through faith. 
are you saved? And that not of yourselves, it's not of works lest any man should boast. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God. Grace and faith is a gift. God gives you the faith to believe. So we have to be careful. Because then he writes here, he says, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. There's a whole lot of people that are ignorant. Ignorance is not a bad thing. Ignorance is not stupid. Ignorance just means unknowing, uneducated, untaught. That's all ignorant is. Stupid is knowing better and still doing stupid. <laughs> That's what stupid is. There's a big difference in the two, right? But ignorant is not like a bad thing, like, you know, calling someone that they should know better. No, ignorant is meaning you don't know better. That's what ignorant is. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, so I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. Through the Spirit of God through me, God's going to show us something together that we, don't know, that we no longer are ignorant. We now will know. And he says here, concerning them which are asleep. Notice the word brethren again. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And our flesh misses someone. I, stood, I remember standing at Angela Green's father's funeral. I had a small part in her, her father's funeral. I remember standing there at her father's funeral. And you, you would, some of you may, Will and Angela visited our church out here one time. They're from Tennessee, but they came out and visited us one time. And I remember standing at her daddy's funeral. I just happened to, we just happened to be back visiting our family. And her father passed away when we were there. I knew her mom and dad. And so they was having the funeral over there. We, we was able to be there, part of that. And, and the preacher, Brother Ralph, asked me, he said, would you be willing to take part in this? And I said, I'd be honored. I remember standing there in front of the church that day, and I said, you know, days like this are far, far much harder on those that remain than the one that's gone. <laughs> because if you know the Lord is our Savior, there's no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more tear, no more pain, no more suffering. It's like instantaneous the body still remains because that's what identifies them to us. We can't see the spirit of a man. We can't see the soul of a man. We can see the results of the soul by the fact that we, what they want to do, what they choose to do, what their likes and dislikes are, and we can see the results of that. We can't really see the spirit and the soul of a man, but we can just see the body. So in seeing the body, sometimes we collate and we identify the person with the body, but really that body's not them. The body's just what carried them. You see this word here earlier in this text, vessel? How we, sh we should know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. Our body's just the vessel. What's in the vessel is what's important. Because if you know what's in the vessel has been made new by Christ, and one of these days he says you're going to get a glorified body. So don't worry about this outward part and how damaged and how sin-stained it is. and Don't worry about how, how crinkly and, de and decrepit it is. Don't worry about that. Quit identifying the person with the body. <laughs> Identify the person with Christ. Because the body's going to be made new. He says, I don't want to have you ignorant, brethren. If you've been made new inside, if, if, you've, if you've possessed your vessel, you try to honor the Lord with your body... If you know because of Christ in you, don't worry about the way the body turns out. If it gets diseased or if it gets riddled. If it, don't worry. Listen, you're going to get a brand new one of those. He says, make sure that you know how to possess it, though. Make sure that you know that there's something inside of the body that knows how to possess the body. That's driving the body. The behavior of the body. He said, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that be passed away or dead, which that's, that you sorrow not. Don't, don't, don't be sorry for them. It's better for them than it's ever been. <laughs> he says, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Will, will God bring with him? Look at verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, and can I say to you this morning, that may be many of us in this room. I believe the Lord's coming soon. I mean, I know the world could get a whole lot more wicked and vile than it is. But I believe it's, it's quickly, quickly, quickly becoming more and more wicked and vile than maybe quicker than ever any time in history. 
And the Bible says that there's some signs. You don't know. No man knows the day or the hour, but there's some signs of the season of my coming. And those signs are there's that false men are going to heap to themselves, having itching ears, false teachers. Look around. You can turn almost on any television, any radio channel that calls itself Christian, look around. They're not even giving the truth. They don't even declare the gospel. They're, living their, they're not possessing their vessels in sanctification and honor. They're living their life just like, just like they did on Saturday night at the bar. They're living that way on Sunday in the church. They're changing God's word. The Bible says be careful with that. At the end of the Bible, it says in Revelation chapter 22, be careful with changing God's word, adding to or taking away from. Because it may just end up at your parts taken out of heaven. You say, well, I don't know what that means. I don't either completely. But that has the idea of, God has a place, if you will, a line for your name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You get that, right? Like Miss Jeannie's back here. She's back for her trip to California. We're, we're glad to have her back. Amen. But at her mother's funeral here, we had, there was a reception book. In that book, there were lines. You know what those lines were for? For you to put your names on. There's a line there for your name. The Bible says he's not willing to any should perish, but all should come to repentance. In other words, he has a place for the name of everyone. Catch this real quickly. You start tampering with God's word. You start tampering with God's doctrine of salvation. You start taking things out, adding things to. Your place might just be taken out. Think about that. That's serious. Because how do you come to know Christ if you can't be introduced to Him from the Word of God? Because all we know of heaven and hell and, the, and, and, and God and the devil and all we know of promises of the heaven and, and the condemnation, all we know is from the Bible. So we start changing the Bible and we take out the truth. And the truth is what sets us free. It says be careful with that. And yet people are tampering with it every day. There's more, there's more versions, more translations, if you want to call them, coming out all the time. Be careful with that. The Bible says that He came to this earth to bleed and die, suffer all things so that all of mankind through His blood could be saved. That's the gospel according to the Scriptures, the Bible says. If we change the Scriptures, then we don't have the gospel. That's what the Bible says. It literally declares it out. This is the gospel. How that Christ came. How that He was buried, how he arose again from the third day, I mean how he died, how he was buried, how he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The Bible actually says it that way. If we start changing the Bible, then we don't have the gospel. But be careful about that. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. Some of us, I along with probably everyone in this room, have loved ones that have gone on before. People that I was very close to. The people that, that left a testimony of knowing Christ. Some, quite frankly, I've got some family members that have died that I hope knew the Lord, but I really, I don't know. But you know what he says here? I don't want you to be ignorant. If you're saved, and they were saved, maybe you didn't see the fruit of the salvation in their life. But if they were saved, that if you're alive when the Lord comes back, don't worry. Because the dead which are in Christ will rise first. Those, those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. So here's all I can say. Some of my family and friends, I don't know if they were saved when they died or not. I hope. I, I've tried to be diligent in giving the gospel. I've talked to them many a times. One of my friends literally said to me one time these exact phrases. I'd been missing him for probably six or eight months or longer. He and I communicated a lot, and he's in Tennessee and I was in Arizona, but we communicated a lot, and, and for six or eight months, I couldn't get a hold of him. My wife will tell you. I had tried. I called everybody I knew that knew him. I would called neighbors that lived in the community he lived in, and I couldn't find him. And I thought, oh, man, I hope nothing's left. I knew he was lost. I had talked to him about the Lord so many times. Probably about 1 o'clock in the morning one night, my phone rings, and, and I seen it. It was a Newport, Tennessee phone number. He lived in Bybee, but my phone rings. I said, hello? Daryl Rowe! I said, what's going on? I called his name. 
I said, man, I said, I'm so glad to hear your voice. I said, I've been trying for months to find you, man. His exact next line was this. He said, you thought I'd already died and gone to hell, didn't you? I said, that's exactly what I was afraid of. I had talked to him about the Lord so many times. He's dead now. I don't know where he's at. But I'll say this. If he ever trusted Christ as his Savior, we're going to be reunited one of these days. The life he lived, vile, sinful, before Christ, will have no part in his eternal home if he trusted Christ. The body that would be that we carry around sometimes, it's wrecked by the consequences and the actions of sin. And you say, well, I, uh, you know, uh, look at Brother Bill. He's having some health issues, and, and he, he's, he's not been some vile. Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There's none righteous, no, not one. Brother Bill may not have been vile and wicked, but he's born condemned just like the rest of us. And you know what that means? We're going to have the consequences of sin upon our body. We'll be apt for disease, apt for weakness and sickness. I say, but but I, don't, I wish it wasn't that way for someone like Mr. Bill and Miss Joyce. And I know. I, I know. But the reality of it is simply this. This does not identify this couple. This is just a vessel that carries them around. One of these days, because they've trusted Christ your Savior, they'll be identified with a glorified body. So we think about it next week anniversary homecoming of the church. So we may not have some people here that we wish were. I was thinking just this past week about a lot of the folks in our church over the 13, 13 years. That's not very long at all, but I, it's like, wow, I, I couldn't believe how many people had stepped into eternity already. Wow. People that once came to this church, walked through the doors, whether it be in the house on Carousel, the house on Lobo, or the building next door, this building, people that walked the doors of this church, people stepped into eternity already. I thought, but it's not just... They're not just gone. To be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. Now one of these days, it's an amazing thing, and he declares for us here, one of these days, he says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, verse 15, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the death and Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice this, and so shall we. That would be the two parts that make up the previous sentence, the previous verse. Those which were dead in body, but now are alive in body. They, they were never dead in trespass and sins since they trusted Christ our Savior. They would, it was quick and made alive from that moment. But there, because we were alive in our body here doesn't mean that we'll be separated from them who weren't alive in their body when the Christ comes. We'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And together, notice this, and together we, let me find my place here, uh, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together uh, with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and, to, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So come and just say to you this morning this simple thing. If you know Christ your Savior and you have loved ones that's passed on you, Christ your Savior, don't worry about them. We wouldn't want them to trade one minute, one second of their time with the Lord for another lifetime upon this earth. Don't worry about them. Because together, those which are dead in Christ, as long as those which are alive and remain in Christ, shall be caught up in the air to be with the Lord in the air. Together we will be with the Lord forever. 
No more separation. Not only will we be together forever, but we will be with the Lord forever. We will never be separated from Him. Not, I, well, I, he leaves us out of us now, but we'll never be separated from Him bodily. We will be bodily with Him forever. But if you don't know Christ, then this doesn't pertain to you. And can I say to you this morning, whether you're here visiting this morning or whether you're here regular, no one in this room wants you to be absent on that great homecoming day. No one in this room wants you to be absent that day. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed this morning.